Hello there, my sleepy night. And tonight is a special journey through the realms of fantasy, where we'll weave together three of our most enchanting cozy tales into one relaxing video. From mythical lands of dragons to legendary knights, witches and wizards, each story will transport you to a world beyond your imagination. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more magical adventures. But if you'd really like to support the channel, you can do that now on Patreon. The link is below. But for now, let's get cozy and embark on this sleepy fantasy quest together. Let the tales begin. The cursed tavern sat nestled deep in a dark, misty forest, far from any well-traveled road. With its faded sign and crumpling stone facade, it was easy to miss, as so many exiled creatures did. But. For those barred from every other magical tavern and inn, its sturdy oaken door stood open as a last refuge. The propertyer, Finnegan McMurdoch, was a leprechaun, exiled long ago from the fairy circles for his distaste of gold. He too was cursed, doomed to never leave the premises of the cursed tavern. Ach, silver's the true prize, he'd grumble into his ale each night. Gold's for show-offs. Of course, his solitary disposition earned him no favours among the fairy folk either. The rest of his staff was similarly cursed, forced to eternally work at the tavern as punishment for past magical misdeeds. There was Twiggy, an impish fairy whose tricks were the bane of Finnegan's existence, and Siobhan, the mute witch cook banished for sharing forbidden elixirs and spells. Then there was Harry, the headless half-giant doorman, cursed to spend his days holding his talking head. I'll keep watch for trouble, he'd wheeze. Mark me words, Mr. McMurdoch, it's coming. And maybe Harry was right, because tonight Finnegan rushed through the cursed tavern in a panic. The Vampire Support Group, Vampires Anonymous, or the VA, were booked in for a meeting tonight in the function room, and in typical flustered fashion, Finnegan had forgot all about it. The ancient inn was bustling with its usual menagerie of odd patrons, 
hags cackling over brews, dwarfs arm wrestling for gold, a gaggle of crooning pixies fluttering about. But Finn paid them no mind, focused only on preparing the meeting room before the vampires arrived. Suddenly, a loud rap on the door startled him. Fen opened it to find several pale-faced vampires, led by a smartly dressed chap named Valentine. Good evening, Valentine greeted with a toothy grin. We're here for the... V.A. meeting. Oh, and you did get the uh, letter about the vegan blood substitute for the event. Oh, yeah, 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 yes, the vegan blood substitute. Finn stammered in confusion. Yes, we sent the letter ahead. You see, we've all sworn off real blood. Valentine explained matter-of-factly. So the vegan alternative would be most appreciated. Finn hesitated, then nodded. Of course, yes, yes, I, I, I have it ready for you. I'll see to it straight away. Finn closed the door and turned to the fairy housekeeper, Twiggy, who was busying herself nearby. Twiggy. The vampires need a vegan blood drink, and quick, tell me you can whip something up. Twiggy raised an eyebrow, equally puzzled, but she could see the desperation in Finn's eyes. I'm supposed to be the housekeeper. Ah, oh, Finn, I'll see what I can do, she replied dubiously before heading to the kitchen. Finn took a deep breath, hoping Twiggy could somehow satisfy the odd request as the VA meeting was set to begin. Outside, Harry the headless half-giant doorman hovered aimlessly around the gardens of the cursed tavern, scanning for potential threats with his detached head. The misty grounds were quiet as dusk settled in. Harry, carrying his disembodied head, which had a lantern affixed to it to light the way, heard a faint rustling sound from the bushes. He turned to find a small gnome attempting to hide. The gnome wore a Scottish kilt and a Tam O'Shanter hat. Ugh, don't crush me, Mr. Half-Giant, he cried in a Scottish burr cowering in fear. I'm but a wee harmless soul, and lost and frightened, so I am. Taken aback, Harry leaned down, the lantern on his detached head illuminating the shivering creature. Why, he seemed harmless, the poor little thing. There now, don't be scared, Harry rumbled gently. I'll not harm you, you little gnome. The gnome peered up with wide, pleading eyes. Oh, bless you, kind sir. You know, at night I'd make a fine pet for your head. I could cuddle you in. I'm wonderful for snuggling and keeping company in the wee hours. 
Harry considered this, finding the gnome rather cute. He could use a friend to keep his detached head company on long, lonely nights. Very well, little fellow. You may stay a while, Harry declared. Delighted, the gnome grinned. Harry decided to sneak his newfound pet inside the cursed tavern. Meanwhile, Twiggy hurried down the hall towards the kitchen, her mind spinning. How could she possibly craft a vegan blood substitute for vampires? She entered the chaotic kitchen, where Siobhan, the mute witch cook, stood silently tending a bubbling pot. Immune to the surrounding commotion. Siobhan, I must make this vegan blood drink quickly, Twiggy exclaimed in a panic. But I haven't the faintest idea how. Siobhan simply smirked and shook her head as she chopped vegetables, leaving Twiggy to her task. First, Twiggy tried mashing beets to stimulate the thickness of blood, but the resulting concoction was an appalling, murky brown. Siobhan laughed silently as Twiggy grimaced at the mess. Next, Twiggy attempted a blend of rusty-looking spices and dark berry juices but the mixture immediately separated into unnatural chunks and pools. Siobhan chuckled again at Twiggy's growing frustration. Suddenly, Finn entered the kitchen, checking on Twiggy's process. Nearly done then, lass, he asked, hopefully. Twiggy frowned. Not quite. This is servant's work, not mine. Can't you ask Siobhan to do it? She's the cook. Finn shook his head. Siobhan's busy feeding the guests and the bar. Please, come on, just keep trying your best. The, the, the meeting starts any minute now. Come on, hurry up, please. Finn rushed off. As Twiggy puzzled over a boiling vat of crimson cabbage, she heard a small voice pipe up. Psst! Hey, over here! I can help with that concoction, dearie. She turned to see the little Scottish gnome peeking out from a cupboard. Who are you? Twiggy asked. Suspiciously. Oh, just a wee friend with solutions, the gnome replied. But my name's Declan, if you must know. <laughs> Let me show you a trick that's sure to do the trick. <laughs> Twiggy hesitated, but stepped aside. Perhaps this peculiar little creature could aid in the troublesome task after all. Finn crept to the back room, peeking in at the circle of pale vampires. Valentine stood and addressed the group. Good evening, friends. I'm Valentine. And I'm a vampire. Hello, Valentine. The rest of the group responded in unison. It's been 14 days since my last taste of human blood. Valentine continued. Well done, praised one vampire. 
the struggle is real, brother, said another. And just last week, I feasted on a juicy village girl. There were sounds of disapproval. Now, Cedric, abstinence, abstinence, Valentine reminded. Cedric nodded shamefully. Of course, I... I must resist temptation. Tonight, let us enjoy the provided vegan alternative and renew our commitment to sobriety. The brew should be here any moment, Valentine proclaimed. Finn, watching on, was sweating now, his heart beating madly. He could make a good bit of silver every week off these VA meetings if they went well tonight. Just at that moment, Twiggy arrived, holding a large vat of vegan blood. Finn rushed her into the room. Hurry up for God's sake, get that in there. Twiggy entered the room, ladling the vegan blood into goblets and distributing them to the vampires, who sniffed suspiciously at the concoction. Finn watched on. After a few tentative first sips, however, the vampire faces lit up with delight. My, this is, this is just marvelous, Valentine declared. Rich, robust, yet animal-free, well done, well done. Mummers of agreement echoed from the group as they eagerly drank more. Finn heaved a private sigh of relief, thanking his luck and Twiggy's resourcefulness. Perhaps this meeting would go smoothly after all. Next. Finn was weaving through the crowded tavern bar, waving off drunken requests from patrons. When he spotted a peculiar sight at the bar, a little gnome sat perched on a stool, discreetly sipping an ale. As Finn approached the minuscule fellow, he realized with a start that he recognized that wrinkled face and wispy white beard. It was none other than Declan, a scheming old gnome who had been the bane of Finn's existence back in his leprechaun days. Leprechauns and gnomes had always been bitter rivals. But Finn and Declan had a particularly thorny history. Declan took specific joy in tormenting Finn with cruel pranks and tricks, causing no end of trouble in the fairy circles. His cheeky grin alone was enough to make Finn's blood boil. Declan! You poisonous toadstool. What in blazes are you doing here? Finn bellowed, grabbing the gnome by the neck. Declan feigned innocence at first, his milky eyes going wide in exaggerated shock. But that familiar smug grin quickly crept across his face. Well, if it isn't Finnegan McMurdoch, my old leprechaun pal, he exclaimed with mock delight. I heard you got yourself exiled from the fairy circles. 
guess you're stuck running this dingy place now, eh? Finn bristled, his hands bowling into fists. You've got some nerve showing your weasley face here. After the stunts you pulled back in the circles. I won't have your nasty gnome tricks in my tavern. Do you hear me? Declan simply cackled. Clearly enjoying getting under Finn's skin. Ah, still a temperamental beanpole, I see. Always wear a sensitive one. He prodded Finn in the belly, mockingly. Does it still burn you up, seeing how we gnomes live all cosy, while you lumbering leprechauns storm about like big ogres? Finn saw red, shaking with rage. Listen here, you poisonous mushroom. I know what you're about. Nothing but trouble follows gnomes, especially rotten ones like you, Declan. Declan frowned at the insulting nickname, but his smug grin quickly returned. Now, now, laddie, no need for name calling. I'm just here to help you in this fine establishment. He flashed an exaggerated smile. Finn opened his mouth to retaliate, when a vampire's voice suddenly cut through the din, urgently calling his name. With a final smouldering glare at Declan, Finn turned away and pushed his way through the crowd to assist with the vampires. But this was far from over. Finn peered inside the vampires' meeting room. The vampires were growing increasingly frantic, desperately gulping down Twiggy's vegan blood substitute and clamouring for more. Bring us another vat, one shouted. Valentine, appearing equally on edge, rose and approached Finn at the door. Pardon me, Mr. Murdoch, but I'm afraid we require an additional batch, post-haste, he requested with a shake in his voice. Finn hesitated, unnerved by their ravenous states, but customer service prevailed. Right away, Mr. Valentine, he replied, rushing off to tell Twiggy. The vampire's agitation mounted as they awaited the next round. Valentine attempted to regain order, but it was clear the brew had awakened something wild in his flock. hurried anxiously down the creaking hallway toward the kitchen, the raucous screams of the vampires ringing in his ears. He needed to ask Twiggy to ready another batch of her vegan blood substitute immediately. As he reached the kitchen doorway, the thick metallic scent of blood hit him instantly. He stopped short at the nightmarish sight before him. There were at least fifteen pallid, drained corpses piled in the corner, flies already gathering on their sunken faces. Twiggy hummed cheerily as she drew blood from a gangly man with a roughly etched vegan tattoo into a steaming cauldron, his empty eyes staring lifelessly ahead. Twiggy, 
What in blazes are you doing? What is this ghastly scene? Finn cried, clutching his chest in horror. Oh, it's the only thing satisfying those vampires now, Twiggy casually replied, not looking up from her gruesome task. That helpful gnome Declan has been bringing me wanderers and vagabonds to drain. All vegans, so no animals harmed. Finn felt bile rise in his throat as he took in the atrocities surrounding him. Declan, I should have known. This, this is madness. We can't serve blood harvested from murdered vegans, he sputtered in protest. Twiggy shrugged. Oh, it's just a few drifters no one's gonna miss. Besides, listen to that chaos out there. The vampire's frenzied shrieks echoed from the meeting room, hungry, enraged. Finn hesitated, sweating profusely, as he realised he couldn't cut off their supply now without risking disaster. After an anguished pause, he gave Twiggy a small defeated nod. Just, just keep it coming for now, he managed weakly. Twiggy grinned and whistled as she got back to work. Finn stumbled from the room, his stomach churning with shame and horror. That wicked gnome had orchestrated this perfectly, he thought bitterly. Trapped by his own desperation to satisfy the vampires, he now found himself complicit in Twiggy's vile deed. Finn hurried back toward the tavern bar eager to put some distance between himself and Twiggy's ghastly operation. But halfway down the corridor, blood-curdling screams suddenly pierced the air. Oh no, what now? Finn cried in dismay, rushing ahead. He burst into the bar and skidded to a halt confronted by complete chaos. Several vampires from the meeting had broken loose and were savaging patrons. One dwarf was having his beard ripped off as a vampire sank her fangs into his neck. Other creatures tried fleeing for the exit or grabbing makeshift weapons in defense as the vampires gave in to raging bloodlust. A hag was dragged screaming across the bar by her gnarled feet. The air was filled with pleas for mercy and savage hissing. Control yourselves, brothers, Valentine shouted from the back doorway, but the vampires were too far gone consumed by primal hunger. Near the rafters, Declan the gnome fluttered about, cackling gleefully at the carnage below. Oh, nicely done, laddie. You've outdone yourself this time, he called mockingly to Finn, frozen in shock. Finn surveyed the nightmarish scene. The vampires had become mindless killers, and his innocent patrons were paying with their lives. All around him shrieks of terror and Declan's taunting laughter. Finn's legs went weak at the horrors he had unwittingly unleashed. 
amidst the blood-curdling chaos in the cursed tavern bar. Finn rushed back to the kitchen, hoping to find help. There, he found Siobhan calmly chopping vegetables, paying no mind to the pile of drained vegan bodies behind her. Siobhan, you must come quickly, Finn urged. Some of the vampires have gone berserk, attacking the patrons. We need your magic to stop them, please, Siobhan. With a silent nod, Siobhan followed Finn out, wielding only a garlic wreath. As they entered the bar, vampires were savaging necks while Declan cackled manically above. Siobhan stepped forward and raised the garlic wreath high. She closed her eyes in concentration as it began glowing brightly. The vampires hissed in pain and shielded their eyes. Wretched hag, stop this magic. Valentine commanded, but retreated from the wavering garlic wreath. The chaotic energy began settling as the vampires backed away from Siobhan's spell. Nearby, Headless Harry had pulled some patrons to safety. Stay behind me, I'll fend them off, he told a cowering group. As Finn watched Siobhan regain control, he breathed a sigh of relief. Her magic had succeeded where his tavern management had utterly failed. As Siobhan subdued the vampires, Finn turned his fury toward the real culprit, Declan cackling wildly above the chaos he had created. You wretched fungus, Finn bellowed, swiping at the fluttering gnome with a broom. This is your twisted handiwork. Declan dodged nimbly, wagging his finger. No, no, I just gave them a little push. <laughs> Not my doing if things got messy. Lunging forward, Finn swiped at the gnome again. You'll plague my tavern no more, you poisonous toadstool. Nearby, Harry frowned sadly. But he's such a sweet little fellow. I want to keep him as a pet, Mr. Murdoch. Maybe he meant well. Finn gaped at Harry, exasperated. He wanted to make you his pet, you big oaf. He lives only for mayhem. As Declan glided by, humming merrily, Finn hit him with a blast of magic sending the gnome tumbling out the door into the dirt. My tricks are better than yours, laddie. Declan screeched as he flailed. If I see your wretched face here again, you'll get far worse than that, Finn shouted. He turned back to the wreckage Declan caused as Harry pouted over the loss of his would-be pet. With Declan gone, Finn rushed to help Siobhan contain the remaining frenzied vampires. She waved her glowing garlic wreath, driving them back into the function room. One vampire snarled and lunged at Siobhan but was repelled by the garlic's aura. Siobhan continued strategically waving it, 
forcing the vampires towards the meeting room as Finn herded them with a chair. Finally, the glowing garlic wreath's power seemed to penetrate the creatures. They froze in place, shaking their heads in confusion. My goodness, what came over us? One said, appearing distraught over his blood-smeared hands. We must have temporarily lost our senses, said another. Please accept our deepest apologies. Is there another vat of the vegan blood coming soon? Finn sighed with relief as the garlic snapped them out of their ravenous trance. With bowed heads, the vampires shuffled back to their meeting, mortified by their behavior. Finn shut the door behind them, and Siobhan locked it with a magical flick of her hand. Well, I guess I better get Twiggy to send in another vat of vegan blood. As dawn broke, the Vampire's Anonymous members gathered their belongings, unable to meet anyone's gaze. Please take this gold as our deepest apology, Valentine offered Finn sincerely, but Finn waved it away. We accept no gold here, only silver in this tavern. The vampires nodded and returned with glistening silver coins instead, which Finn accepted with gratitude. Might we perhaps use your tavern for our next meeting? Valentine asked hopefully. We promise to keep our wits about us next time. Finn's eyes lit up. Aye, as long as you keep the silver coming, you're always welcome here, he assured them. As the vampires departed into morning's light, Finn felt a wave of relief. Finn slumped behind the bar, exhausted by the night's antics. Twiggy and Siobhan emerged quietly to start sweeping up debris. Harry soon joined them as the cursed inn slowly restored itself to its familiar organized clutter. Watching his staff work, Finn thought back on the series of bizarre events that led to last night's disaster. Managing such an unusual tavern certainly posed challenges. But if this motley crew could survive such madness, then perhaps there was hope for the cursed tavern yet. You toss and turn in your bed, willing yourself to fall asleep. But it's no use. Sleep evades you once again, slipping through your grasping fingers like a bar of soap 
in a bath. This blasted insomnia. It's been plaguing you for weeks now. Dark circles sag under your eyes and your bones feel heavy with fatigue. But still, when you lay your head down at night, your mind buzzes like a hive of restless bees. With a sigh, you throw off the covers and sit up, rubbing your bleary eyes. Moonlight streams through the window of your bedchamber, illuminating the modest furnishings. You are Sir Galantine, a knight in service to King Harwick these past five years. By day, you train with sword and shield, patrol the castle grounds, stand guard at boring ceremonies. But lately, your effectiveness has suffered under the burden of chronically broken sleep. The king's physician has given you every remedy imaginable. You've swallowed vile concoctions of warm milk and herbs, soaked your feet in steaming buckets of water, engaged in vigorous exercise before bed. Hell, You've even had him try bloodletting to balance your humours. Nothing works. But lately, whispers have reached your ears of an old wizard who lives deep in the misty woods. They say he possesses the secrets of the deepest sleep that he alone knows a story so soporific, so tediously long-winded, that merely listening to it brings on an instant, powerfully restful slumber. Could this be the cure you seek? Climbing out of bed, you dig through your trunk, searching for the map you acquired from a travelling merchant some months ago. It's said to lead directly to the wizard's secluded cottage. After tossing clothes and books aside, you finally find it, rolled up in a battered leather case. You take it over to the window, Unroll it and study it carefully by moonlight. The map shows the wizard's cottage lies many leagues away, in a remote corner of the misty woods marked Here Be Dragons. Between here and there, you trace a route winding through three distinctive areas. The plain of perpetual peril, the hills of deathly doom, and the valley of eternal despair. Pleasant names, you think, with a smirk. Clearly. Reaching the wizard will be no easy feat, but you're desperate for a cure, so you have no choice but to undertake this quest. After donning your armour, you creep quietly out of the castle, 
not wanting to explain yourself to the guards. In the royal stables, your faithful steed lifts his head at your approach and whines softly in greeting. You saddle up and ride out across the moonlit fields surrounding the castle. The cool night air feels bracing, helping to keep your heart alert. You'll need your wits about you, since peril lurks behind every rock or tree once you reach these mysterious lands ahead. As the battlements and towers of the castle recede behind you, foreboding starts to set in. You've heard rumours of all sorts of monsters, lurking in the plain of perpetual peril. Grim tales of bogs that can swallow a man whole, and roads that disappear under a traveller's feet. Pulling your cloak tighter against the chill, you resolve to proceed carefully and keep your sword hand ready. After several hours of riding, the moon sinks below the horizon and the world darkens. Right on schedule, the sun peeks up washing the plains ahead in a bloody reddish light. This is the plain of perpetual peril. Taking a deep breath to steady your nerves, you give your steed an encouraging pat on the neck. Well, old friend, into the valley of death we ride. With that less than comforting thought, you nudge him onward crossing the known world into hazardous unknown territory. You've heard it said that the perimeter of the plain is protected by invisible guardians who permit safe passage only to the pure of heart. And considering the lack of sleep has made you crusty as mouldy bread, You'll be lucky enough to escape with your skin. As your horse carries you deeper into the plain, you strain your eyes for glimpses of the gruesome guardians or other dangers. But strangely, everything seems calm. Eerily so. The landscape around you remains obstinately normal. Just fields, trees, boulders. Harmless. After two hours without the slightest peep from a bloodthirsty gowl, you start to wonder if the rumours of peril were exaggerated. But just then, a hark, what sight ahead doth bold ill fortune. A clearing opens up, and there before you lies an enormous dragon, ruby scales glinting, rippling as it snores, lost in slumber. Vast mounds of glittering coins, jewels and artefacts make up its treasure hoard. Your eyes widen with greed. 
Here is the solution to your money wars. While the beast is sleeping, you quietly dismount and sneak towards the treasure, heart pounding. You fill your pockets with fistful of precious jewels and coins. Just as you're cramming the last few trinkets in your bag, your elbow knocks over a golden goblet, which clangs loudly on the stony ground. The dragon's eyes snap open, and a plume of smoke rises from its nostrils. You dare steal from I, the mighty dragon Slathborg. Now you shall burn. A jet of flame shoots from the dragon's mouth. You hurl yourself behind a boulder just in time. The blistering heat singes your eyebrows and the back of your neck. Drawing your sword, you leap out to face the monstrous beast. Though you fight bravely, stabbing and slashing wherever you get close enough, your blade cannot pierce its armoured hide. Meanwhile, Slathborg's claws and flaming breath ravage the clearing, lighting trees aflame and reducing boulders to rubble. You cannot hope to defeat this devil. When it pauses to roar in fury, an idea strikes you. Stay your wrath, great dragon, you cry. I meant no harm. Let us strike a deal. Release me unscathed, and upon my return, I shall repay you twofold for all I have taken. The dragon considers this with a grumble, and then says, You speak fairly, knight. I shall agree to your pact, but heed me well. If you do not fulfill your oath, I shall hunt you to the ends of the earth. You bow, then quickly gather up the remaining spilled coins from the ground and flee while the dragon is placated. Of course, you have no more intention of returning than a fox has of guarding a hen house. Onward, to find the wizard. The foul swamp threatens to swallow your brave steed as you press onward through. In the distance, a ramshackle cottage on stilts emerges from the scraggly trees. Out hobbles the most hideous crone imaginable, warty nose dripping. Welcome, Sir Knight, she croaks. I am Agnes the Swamp Witch. Have you come seeking my magical remedies? Wary but curious, you ask. What remedies have you, old mother? Elixirs, potions to cure any mortal malady, she proclaims with a gap-toothed grin. But for insomnia, my greatest treasure brings the deepest slumber imaginable. 
one sip gifts eight hours of blissful oblivion. Hopeful, you inquire. Your words intrigue me, woman. What price would you ask for this draught? Agnes draws uncomfortably close, claw-like hand upon your chest. Suppressing a shudder, you stand fast. Your heart beats boldly, brave Galantine, she muses. I'll make you a different offer. Give me your hand in marriage, and the potion shall be yours. You recoil from this alarming proposition. You wish to be my wife for a potion. Surely you jest. The crone shakes her head. I never jest concerning affairs of the heart. Pledge to wed me upon your return, and sleep shall be yours. Repulsed but desperate, you bow your head. So it be, hag. Give me the potion, and you have my hand. Giggling with glee, Agnes ushers you inside her cluttered cottage. She presents an ancient scroll, a marriage contract. Eyes shut, you scroll your name. Cackling, Agnes produces a small vial and passes it to you. Drink up, darling, and enjoy sweet slumber. The liquid smells of sulfur and soap wort, but you swallow it fully. Wooziness instantly overtakes you. The crone's face blurs and dims away. A gleeful cackle echoes as you feel your senses leave you completely. Though alarm bells clang in your fading mind, tis too late. The potion drags you down into some fathomless darkness. Deeper you fall, enveloped by the black embrace of unending sleep. Or is this death? You cannot move, breathe, or see. Then, you are moving upward, speeding through a tunnel towards a soft light. Wonderment fills you. Are you now bound for heaven? The glow surrounds completely, warming your being with hope. But as your eyes adjust, your heart sinks. The barren landscape all around is purgatory. The wretched mists of purgatory close around you, obscuring whatever landscape might exist in this dreary plain. Fellow damned souls drift past, locked in their own misery. The anguish cries of the dead echo faintly, mirroring the lamentations of your own heart. You wander alone. No destination, but more empty eternity ahead. Sleep remains impossible in this bleak in-between realm. A 
and so you shuffle onward, one foot in front of the other, longing for the oblivion of true rest. The featureless fog parts for a moment, revealing a stone archway leading into darkness. Lured by curiosity, you pass beneath the arch into a massive chamber with towering ceilings lost in shadow. Your footsteps echo strangely against the cold floor. Squinting through the gloom, you discern a large mirror mounted in an ornate frame in the chamber's center. This sole object catches your eye standing out starkly, drawn by some instinct. You approach the mirror to look upon its surface. At first, only darkness looks back, but then your features slowly materialize out of the void. The face staring back appears haggard, with sunken eyes and hair greyed prematurely. Your skin looks sallow and wrinkled beyond your years. In the eyes of this reflection you see bottomless sadness and regret. The spark that once animated your spirit in life has gone, leaving behind this hollow stranger. You reel back in dismay. This wretched creature cannot be you. But the mirror does not lie. This is the face of one condemned to purgatory for trafficking with dark powers and folly. You fortified your vitality and now you must pay the price. Overwhelmed by the pitiful sight, you turn away and sink to your knees. Hot tears spill down your cheeks. You weep not just for the lost youth and splendor, but also for the deeper decay of your soul. What twisted greed and thirst for magic aided the witch in her deception? You call yourself a knight, but you have strayed far from any path of honor. The poor wretch in the mirror deserves his miserable fate. He is no knight, only a fool. On hands and knees, racked by sobs, you pound your fist against the icy floor. But no pain comes, for you no longer have flesh to feel. Your spirit alone endures this torment now. For untold time you remain there letting wave after wave of shame and self-loving crash over you. You dare not to look again at the mirror's judgment. At last you rise unsteadily and stumble back through the archway, leaving the dreaded mirror behind. Once more adrift in the mist, Despair threatens to pull you under. How can you forgive such a reckless stupidity as led to this fate worse than death? 
your longing for sleep brought ruin upon you. There can be no atonement for one so weak and vain. The lost souls you pass pay you no heed, each locked in their own personal anguish. If only salvation could be found here. But purgatory offers only uncounted errors of melancholy penance. After further empty times of wandering, a hunched figure emerges from the gloom ahead. An ancient man with a long white beard, leaning heavily upon a crooked staff. His eyes shine with wisdom and kindness beneath snowy brows. As you approach the ancient being, he lifts a liver-spotted hand in greeting. Well met, good night, he says, his voice strong despite his aged frame. Few souls I encounter here retain such honour, but remorse weighs heavy on your spirit. You bow your head humbled by his presence. I, I have strayed far from any nightly path, and now pay the price, old father. You hesitate, and then ask, how might one find redemption in this colourless abyss? The elder considers you thoughtfully. I compose three riddles whose answers may illuminate the path forward if you have ears to hear them. At your nod, he begins. My first riddle is what must be granted when it cannot be earned. You ponder the strange question. Purgatory offers no gifts freely given. What could be granted undeservedly if not? Forgiveness, you reply. Your first answer is forgiveness. The elder smiles. Well done. My second riddle is what grows the more it is shared. Again, you think carefully in purgatory misery and solitude reign, what alone might flourish being given to others? The answer must be love, you say slowly. You are correct, says the elder. Now the final riddle. What sees not its own worth? You close your eyes, seeking the heart of this riddle. What overlooks its own value, yet is precious. At last you open your eyes. The answer is gratitude, you state. For gratitude recognizes not itself. The elder beams. You have divined all three right. Dwell upon those answers 
and your way forward shall become clear. He lays a hand upon your shoulder. May hope guide your journey, Sir Knight. Then he turns and hobbles away into the mist. You stare after the departing elder. Could the answers to his riddles be the key to your redemption? You resolve to contemplate their meaning. Forgiveness. Love. Gratitude. As you turn the riddles over in your mind, the first glimmers of understanding dawn. You have judged yourself too harshly. Yet, forgiveness cannot be earned, only granted. You must forgive yourself for your mistakes. And you must open your heart to self-love. Though loneliness surrounds you, only by sharing love freely can it multiply and drive out despair. Finally, gratitude. You lost sight of life's graces and bounty, yet they remain. You must remember to be grateful though you stand in darkness. The old man's wisdom kindles a fragile hope in you. You begin the long journey of forgiving yourself and seeing through gentler eyes. Though the task seems monumental, for the first time you glimpse the possibility of redemption. As you walk, tears once more fill your eyes, but not self-pity. I am sorry, you whisper to your heart, to the universe, forgive me please. The words lift a tiny portion of sorrow's weight. You focus on welling up gratitude for your years of life. You picture your face not as the mirror showed it, but bright with love and joy. The face of a man you wish to become little by little, your spirits grow lighter. When other souls pass by, you nod to them with compassion, wishing you could share the small comforts you've found. The fog around you seems to thin. Has Purgatory's terrain changed? Or is that your perception? Up ahead, the mist begins swirling rapidly, filled with blinding white light. Apprehension, an exhilaration war within you. The light overwhelms your vision completely. You feel your essence dissolving away. Then all goes black. Gradually, sensation returns. You feel the chill of a stone floor beneath you and hear a crackling fire. With effort, you open your eyes. Your vision swims into focus on a decrepit chamber lit by torches. Before you stands the hideous, grinning face of Agnes, the Swamp Witch. 
She cackles with glee. <laughs> Welcome back, my betrothed. <laughs> I told you my potion would bring deep slumber. Horrified, you try to scramble away, only to find your limbs still immobilized. The potion's effects linger. Your voice erupts in a strangled yell. Outrage fuels you. With a Herculean effort, you surge upward. You cursed hag. You rasp. I should slay you for your trickery. Agnes only cackles. All will be revealed if you seek the wizard. You hesitate and shove her away. What new devilry are you on about, witch? You demand hoarsely. What wizard? Agnes points towards a wooden door set into the cave wall. The one you seek. He waits just beyond. Knock thrice, and your journey's end shall begin. You eye the door warily, but having come so far, you yearn to confront whatever trap awaits you. Stealing yourself, you stride forward and wrap your knuckles hard upon the wood. The door creaks open and a stooped man leans upon a staff in the entrance. His long white beard and robes mark him unmistakably as the wizard you have sought. Piercing blue eyes meet your gaze. Drawing yourself up straight, you ask in a steady voice as you can muster. I have braved many pearls to find you. Will you now share with me the tale you alone know? The sleepiest story ever told. The wizard's eyes twinkle and his lips curve in a sly smile. My tale is not given freely, dear knight. First, you must indulge an old man. Tell me the story of your quest to arrive here and leave no detail unspoken. You bristle at this game. But since you have no choice but to play along, taking a deep breath, you begin recounting your epic journey. The witch's false bargain, stealing from a dragon, your death cursed by a potion, the endless misery of purgatory, and all you endured seeking redemption. Under the wizard's keen gaze, the entire tale comes pouring out. Your voice grows hoarse from the telling, and weariness seeps into your bones. But you push on, compelled to finish. As you describe the final liberation from Purgatory's mist, your eyes involuntary droop closed. Your words begin to slur as exhaustion weighs down your tongue. 
Still, you struggle to continue the story. But darkness creeps into your mind, silencing your voice. And against your will, blessed sleep overtakes you at long last. You hear the wizard laugh softly. Well done, Sir Knight. Pleasant dreams. His voice echoes as you feel your legs buckle. Strong arms catch you and lower you gently to the floor. Defeated by enchanted weariness, you surrender and descend into slumber. King Alden sat gloomily upon his gilded throne, his crown feeling heavier than ever atop his head. Around him stood his faithful military advisers, resplendent in armor that glinted in the flickering torchlight. Congratulations, your majesty, proclaimed Alden's chief advisor, Lord Talon. With the conquering of the Southern Isles, you have successfully united all kingdoms of the world under your wise and mighty rule. The other advisers murmured in reverent agreement, but Alden stared straight ahead in brooding silence. Lord Talon continued enthusiastically, The bards shall sing songs of your triumphs for generations to come. You have brought order and prosperity throughout the land, from the shifting sands of the east to the frozen peaks of the north. All peoples have been joined together under your great banner. Still, Alden said nothing the shadows accentuating his strong features. My king? questioned Talon uncertainly. The other advisers shifted uneasily, trading uneasy glances. At last, Alden spoke, his voice low and ominous. There are no more lands left to conquer. Talon hesitated briefly. No, your majesty, you have conquered them all. Alden's eyes smoldered. Then I am useless now, am I not? A sword placed back in its sheath, no longer needed. 
the military advisers protested vigorously. But Alden rose abruptly, his rich purple cloak billowing behind him as he turned and strode from the hall. The great doors booming shut behind him. Troubled, the military advisers exchanged glances in the ensuing silence. Their king's will to dominate had never faltered before. They had won the ultimate prize, uniting the entire world under King Alden's banner. Why then did Alden seem so despondent? King Alden wandered the moonlit halls of his castle, lost in brooding thoughts. For as long as he could remember, his life had revolved around waging wars and expanding his empire, grasping at the ultimate mortal power achievable on earth. And now, He had succeeded beyond even his wildest ambitions. Why did he feel so empty? His entire purpose until this moment had been battle, conquest, the struggle for supremacy. But now, no enemies remained to crush, no lands left to conquer. His lifelong goal had been attained. Yet a gnawing void still gripped his soul. Alden's footsteps took him spiraling up the winding stone steps of the castle's highest tower. Emerging onto the open air parapets, he walked to the edge and gazed broodingly out over his capital city. A sea of twinkling lights spread below him. Streets once filled with poverty and violence, now orderly and prosperous under his iron rule. This was everything he had fought and sacrificed to achieve. So why did victory now taste so bitter? What more? was there left to live for? Your Majesty, Your Majesty. Alden turned in a dramatic swirl of his cape as the court astronomer came rushing up the tower steps, clutching an enormous brass telescope. Your Majesty, I've made an in- Discovery. The man panted excitedly. Despite his dark mood, Alden felt a flicker of curiosity pierce the gloom that shrouded his soul. What is it? The astronomer quickly set up his telescope, aiming its lens skyward. He peered briefly through the eyepiece before letting out an ecstatic squeal and beckoning eagerly for Alden to look. Skeptically, Alden bent down and put his eyes to the lens. The blur of stars came into focus, 
resolving into an image of the luminous white orb of the moon. And there, walking slowly across its cratered surface, was a lone figure. Alden's breath caught in his throat. He looked again, afraid his eyes were playing tricks. But there could be no doubt. The unmistakable silhouette of a man was clearly visible, standing upon the moon's gleaming expanse. How? How can this be? Alden exclaimed in wonder. The astronomer quivered with excitement. I don't know, your majesty, but think of the possibilities. We always assume the moon a barren rock, but if someone walks there, Alden's mind began churning with sudden purpose. If life existed on the moon, if there were lands there to explore and conquer, he felt his old ambition reignite, burning the gloom which had shrouded his spirit. Here, was a whole new frontier to investigate, not just for his kingdom, but perhaps for all humankind. The mysteries and challenges presented by this revelation intoxicated him. He turned to the astronomer, eyes blazing with fiery intensity. Alert my engineers at once. Tell them we leave for the moon as soon as a vessel can be prepared. Preparations for the unprecedented lunar voyage quickly swung into motion. Alden summoned the chief advisors and generals, explaining the astonishing developments. At first, they were skeptical, but soon Alden's enthusiasm became infectious. The Royal Engineers drafted plans for specialized equipment and lunar transports. The castle was soon abuzz with excitement and industry. Alden threw himself feverishly into preparations. Impatience and anticipation burning inside him like a furnace. Each night he would climb to the top of the tower to peer anxiously through the telescope. This voyage would provide the sense of purpose he had been lacking since completing his conquest of Earth. A new fire glowed on the horizon, beckoning him to a new era of exploration and glory. At last, the chief engineer burst into the throne room his apprentices staggering under the weight of an enormous rolled parchment, which they unfurled dramatically onto the floor. The assembled court gasped audibly at the diagram it contained, a colossal ladder reaching all the way from the earth up to the luminescent orb of the moon. Alden stepped down to examine the plans. 
eyes widening as he took in the incredible details. The ladder's dimensions were staggering. It called for enchanted lumber harvested from the ancient forest and mythical sky iron mined from fallen stars to provide stability. This is beyond anything I could have conceived, Alden pronounced at last. You have... You have outdone yourself. The chief engineer swelled proudly as excited whispers broke out around the throne room. With this cosmic ladder, they would finally breach the lunar frontier. But after months of backbreaking construction, using the rarest metals and enchanted woods. The giant ladder began swaying dangerously when only halfway completed. Alden watched helplessly from his tower as the massive structure collapsed under its own weight, crashing back down to earth with a peal of thunder. Though disappointed, Alden refused to accept defeat. He pressed his engineers for new ideas. After much debate, they proposed their next concept. Alden's engineers drew up plans for an enormous slingshot mounted on the castle ramparts, designed to launch a projectile with enough speed to escape gravity and escape the lunar sphere. After much calculation, they decided a cow would provide the ideal test payload. The unhappy bovine astronaut was loaded into the sling's pouch, bellowing loudly in protest. Alden watched anxiously as the massive sling was laboriously cranked back, straining against its ropes. Finally, the trigger was released. The sling whipped forward with a mighty twang, but instead of soaring gracefully skyward, the cow flew a short distance before plummeting back down into an awkward arc, landing heavily atop a group of shrieking nobles who frantically scattered from the ramparts. Alden buried his head in his hands in despair. After two disastrous failures, Alden's engineers were despondent. Convinced there was no technologically viable means to breach the vast cosmic gulfs. But Alden stubbornly refused to surrender his dream. He realized only the power of primordial magic could transcend the limitations of modern science and engineering and conjure a vessel capable of transversing the void. He summoned the kingdom's eldest dragon keeper, an ancient sage with leathered skin and a faraway look of wisdom in his eyes. After much counsel, they conceived a bold plan to harness the power of dragons. The wisest 
and most magically attuned creatures known to man. Under the Dragon Keeper's supervision, the Royal Beastmasters selected one of the kingdom's mightiest dragons, Vraxus, an enormous beast with scales the deep crimson of wine. The dragon submitted reluctantly as the Beastmasters fitted it out with an elaborate harness connecting it to a gilded carriage just large enough to transport Alden and his military advisors. The dragon submitted reluctantly as the Beastmasters outfitted it with an elaborate harness connecting it to a gilded carriage just large enough to transport Alden and a handful of his military leaders. The time finally arrived for their historic voyage. At midnight, under the radiance of a full moon, Vrexus spread his massive wings and took flight, towing the precious golden carriage up into the heavens behind him. A rapturous cheer went up from the crowds gathered below. By royal decree, people from all over the kingdom had come to witness Alden's momentous lunar mission launch. As the dragon carried them higher, earth receding below until people looked like ants. Alden raised a jeweled scepter in farewell salute. Then, with a roar, Rexus bore them swiftly aloft, chasing the receding moon. Standing at the prow, Alden was joined by his military advisors, the royal astronomer and the generals of his different armies. Though stoic, all their eyes shone with wonder and excitement for the journey ahead. We make history this day, my friends, proclaimed Alden boldly. Remember this night, which shall usher in a new epoch for humankind. They cheered heartily. Their voices ripped away from the howling winds as the dragon drove on, wings beating in shore strokes through the dark and infinite void. Confronted by the stark immensity of space, the men grew silent and solemn, overawed. The moon swelled ahead of them, no longer some remote point of light, but an entire alien world waiting to be explored and conquered. After an arduous journey that stretched their technology and magic to their very limits, Vraxus heaved his exhausted bulk onto the moon's surface with a roar of victory. They had arrived. But as the explorers disembarked, clumsy in the unfamiliar gentle gravity, they were confronted by a worrying sight. Mighty Vrexus lay on his side, flanks heaving, eyes glazed, completely incapacitated by the ordeal pushed beyond even his mythical limits. Alden rushed anxiously to the dragon's side. Vrexus feebly whimpered, too weak 
to even lift his great horned head. Will he recover? Alden asked urgently. The master dragon keeper carefully examined the prostrate beast. His wrinkled face was grim as he rose again. I fear the voyage might have been a one-way trip. The noble dragon is dying. Stricken, Alden stepped back. For their triumph arrival to be marved so suddenly with a stark reminder of how tenuous their presence was in this alien space. They were not masters here, but intruders. Having sacrificed one of their kingdom's most treasured beasts to reach this barren orb, I will find a way to heal you, brave one. Alden said quietly, but for now, we must make the most of the opportunity you have granted us. Tearing their gazes from the plight of the dying dragon, they began the momentous first steps of humans upon the moon's surface. Alden theatrically planted his royal banner into the soft lunar soil. Its streaming pennants seemed to flutter proudly, despite the absence of any wind. The men marveled at the stark but magnificent vista. Jagged mountains, craters both massive and small, and an eerie stillness undisturbed by any breath of air or call of life. A whole new world, exclaimed the royal astronomer, practically dancing in his excitement. Who knows what we may find here? Unique elements, undiscovered minerals, and perhaps hostile alien beasts lurking amidst those rocks, rumbled the general, hefting his heavy battle axe. Anything could be hiding unknown in this unforbidding place. As the others debated where to explore first, Alden found his gaze drawn to the bizarre figure he had first glimpsed through the telescope. The lone mysterious inhabitant who had drawn him here across the void. Man or beast, why was it here alone? How had it survived on this bleak and sterile orb? He turned to his companions. We must unravel the mysteries of this moon and discover how that lone being survives here. Are you ready, my friends? The small band journeyed for hours across the soundless waste. Aside from their own footprints, the dust lay undisturbed. It was a dead world, but one that may yet hide secrets. Their spirits lifted briefly when Talon, the military advisor, noticed a trail of footprints not their own, leading toward the mountains. Proof, they were not utterly alone here. With renewed eagerness, they tracked the elongated prints stretched by the low gravity for several miles, until finally the trail ended at the sheer face of a cliff. There, 
carved improbably into the living rock, a winding staircase zigzagged up the mountainside. Exchanging nervous but excited glances, the explorers began ascending the steps. The thin lunar atmosphere already taxed their lungs, but they pushed on determinedly, Alden in the lead, until the stairs ended abruptly at a stone-arched doorway. Alden did not hesitate, ducking inside with sword drawn. The others followed bristling with weapons, anxious to confront whatever lay within. They froze as their eyes adjusted to the dim interior, falling upon the chamber's sole occupant. It was the lone lunar wanderer Alden had glimpsed from Earth. A powerfully built man with shaggy ash blonde hair and piercing silver eyes peering out beneath a craggy brow. He rose slowly, returning their stares with equal surprise. Who are you? Alden demanded, leveling his ornate blade at the wild looking stranger. Speak at once. The man gazed at Alden's sword with an expression more of curiosity than fear. When he spoke, his voice was low and rough with disguise, I could ask the same of you, intruders. Alden's herald stepped forward importantly. You stand in the presence of his royal majesty, Alden the Conqueror, ruler of Earth. Kneel before his might and glory. But the shaggy inhabitant only smiled sadly. Glory. Look around you. This is a place of exile and solitude. Alden studied the man closely. Be that as it may, it is now part of my kingdom. He lowered his sword. Who are you? Why dwell here alone? The wild man ran a hand over his unkept beard. I am only the Watcher. I was sent here long ago. To bear witness. Witness to what? demanded a general. To the folly of humankind. The watcher's gaze turned distant. To watch each petty squabble, each kingdom rising and falling through all the cycles of violence. Alden drew himself up. Petty. My achievements are unprecedented. I have united the entire world under one banner. Through fear and blood, replied the Watcher softly. But from my lonely vantage point here, Causes and meanings fall away. Only the pattern remains. Anger flared within Alden. 
you judge too easily. The burdens of leadership do not weigh on you as they do on me. The two men faced each other in tense silence. King and hermit, ruler and mystic. Looking closely, Alden realized that behind the Watcher's stark exterior lay a profound sadness in his eyes. Solitude breeds wisdom, but also despair, Alden said more gently. You have been removed from the world for too long. The Watcher turned away with a bitter laugh. I cannot deny that sometimes this exile weighs heavily. I was not meant to dwell here alone for eternity. His gaze drifted skyward. Alden followed his gaze. From this vantage point, the earth shone like a brilliant sapphire against the black void of space. It's it's so beautiful, Alden murmured. I've never seen it so serene. The Watcher regarded him solemnly. Would you like to see more closely? He led Alden and some of his companions up a winding staircase carved into the mountainside. At the top sat a solitary tower capped with a large crystal telescope pointing toward the glowing earth. My observatory, said the watcher. From here I can see all that transpires below both good and evil. He bade Alden look through the telescope's lens. As Alden peered through, his breath caught in his chest. He saw the earth in more dazzling detail than ever before from his castle parapets. Emerald forests, Sapphire seas sparkled like jewels amidst the swirling white clouds. How gorgeous she is, Alden whispered, awestruck. I never imagined. War, war and suffering mar even the Earth's beauty said the Watcher sadly, but from afar her splendour shines undimmed. The Watcher adjusted the telescope's dials, and the magnified area shifted to reveal the Southern Isles, Alden's latest conquest. Where once there had been rich forests and fertile farmland, now stood only burnt and blackened ruins, refugees wandering homeless. Alden turned away from the telescope, grappling with his entire sense of purpose unraveling. I have been a fool. Blinded by arrogance and ambition. He faced the Watcher beseechingly. But I swear to you, when I return to Earth, I shall strive to undo the harm I have caused. No longer shall I seek to dominate, only to make amends. 
The watcher gazed at him solemnly. Making such a declaration here is one thing. Keeping to it amidst the temptations of power is quite another. Alden fell silent, contemplating the view of the world from this perspective. So tranquil from afar, yet he knew too well the strife and suffering that polluted it still. At last, he drew his sword, the rubies in its hilt glinting in the sunlight. Kneeling, he placed the tip of the blade into the lunar dust before him. And here, upon this lifeless world under the sight of gods and men, I renounce forever the way of bloodshed. I pledge to cleanse the earth of violence and return with compassion as my shield and wisdom as my sword. Alden rose from kneeling and extended a hand to the Watcher. Return with me to Earth, not as my subject, but as my conscience and guide. Help me rebuild what I have destroyed The Watcher hesitated, conflicting emotions played across his weathered face. Return. After so long here, I would surely feel the fury of the gods for abandoning my post. I am their messenger to report to the gods the deeds of humanity. Alden stepped forward eagerly. I am your rightful king, and I insist you come back with us. The Watcher shook his head. You do not understand. It is not for myself that I fear punishment but for the discord it could bring to the world. The legends say this moon is meant only for the lowest of the gods, those who grew too questioning, too sympathetic. I was sent here to bear witness from afar, removed from the plight of men. Comprehension dawned in Alden's eyes. You believe the gods may see you return as a challenge to their will? It is possible, said the Watcher. I cannot predict what consequences may follow if you take me back to Earth. Alden considered this. Your perspective would be invaluable in the reforms I hope to make. But I will not force this duty upon you against your will. Bowing his head respectfully, he turned to go. But the Watcher suddenly grasped his arm, stopping him. Wait. Your words have awoken compassion and hope in me I thought long dead. I will return to earth with you. Come what may, with the gods. His eyes glinted with a newfound resolve. Deeply moved, Alden clasped arms with him. Then, as brothers, We shall face the future. Alden followed the Watcher down the winding stone stairs. 
his mind still reeling from the visions shown to him in the observation tower. He had conquered the world only to inflict more suffering. The realization threatened to shake his sanity to its core. Emerging into the stark sunlight, they headed toward where Alden's advisors awaited around the dying dragon. But Alden slowed, overcome by doubts. How could he face them now? let alone convince them of the revelations that had shattered his spirit. Sensing his hesitation, the Watcher grasped his shoulder. The truth is often bitter, but sharing it lightens the burden. Come, let us go to them. Alden took a deep breath and continued towards his waiting men. A general confronted them with a scowl. There you are, my king. Alden held up a hand. I have seen much on this voyage, including the harm born of my warmongering. I now intend to walk the path of peace. At this, the military advisors bristled with outrage. Peace, spat the general. You dishonor our service with this weakness. Alden drew himself up sternly. I do what honor demands. We must return to Earth as healers, not warriors. Howling in rage, the advisors charged with weapons drawn to the dragon quickly, Alden urged vaulting into the saddle and extending a hand to pull the Watcher up behind. The advisors charged after them, crying treason and drawing weapons. The dragon had just enough strength to lurch skyward, escaping their grasp. As it lurched skyward, The Watcher pulled some crimson poppies from his robe. Here, quickly, let us administer these for the dragon. Their essence may revive him. Together, they fed the dragon the poppy extract. As it struggled to stay airborne, miraculously, The potion seemed to rapidly restore the dragon's strength. With renewed vigor, it stretched its massive wings and soon they were soaring swiftly from the moon's grasp. Alden watched in awe as the tiny figures of the military advisors grew smaller until they faded from view, marooned on the windswept world of the moon. He turned to the Watcher in wonder. However, can I thank you, my friend? We would have perished without your wisdom. The Watcher clasped his shoulder warmly. We helped each other find hope again this day. That is thanks enough. The flight back to Earth was quiet. Alden lost in thought 
as he struggled to process all that had happened. The Watcher, too, seemed deep in contemplation about the future now before them. At last, the blue marble of home came into view, growing steadily larger. Alden felt his heart pounding. How would his people receive him? returning with such shocking revelations. The dragon circled slowly downward through the clouds, angling toward Alden's kingdom below. Alden could make out people swarming excitedly around his castle, cheering the return of their conquering king. But Alden took no joy from their praise this time. His triumphs now felt hollow. With a great rush of wings, the dragon alighted in the castle courtyard. The assembled crowds gasped and knelt reverently as Alden dismounted. He saw confusion in their eyes as they noted the unfamiliar robed figure climbing awkwardly down behind their king. My people, I appear before you much changed. During my journey, I have seen truths that compel me to take new paths. I can no longer walk the way of violence. But, before Alden could explain further, a shimmering light appeared nearby, taking the shape of three radiant figures. The gods themselves. The people collectively inhaled in shock and dropped to their knees. Even Alden and the Watcher instinctively knelt before the Divine Presence. The lead God's voice rang out powerfully. King Alden, your conquests have caused much pain. Will you now make amends, relinquishing all lands seized by force and vowing peace. Heart pounding, Alden raised his head. I solemnly swear it. All wrongfully taken lands shall be returned. Never again will I seek bloody victory, only justice and harmony. Nodding solemnly, the deity turned his piercing eyes upward to address all those assembled. Long ago, in a distant galaxy, we granted you a beautiful world, which you ravaged through carelessness and greed. As punishment, we exiled you here on earth to see if you could change your ways. He gestured toward the kneeling watcher. This being was our eye upon you, to bear witness from afar if mankind could break its cycles of violence and learn greater wisdom, perhaps now, at last, hopeful signs emerge. The god gazed upon Alden and the Watcher, aid this king 
in mending past wounds and forging a new spirit of compassion within these lands. The dawn of lasting peace may truly be within reach. As the gods began to shimmer and fade, Alden met the watcher's tearful, joyful gaze with newfound resolve. Together, they would face the challenges ahead, guiding humanity toward the light. Rising slowly, Alden extended a hand to help the watcher to his feet. Then together, they turned toward the sunrise and the future waiting patiently to be reborn.